Hello and welcome to Genealogy Adventures. I'm Brian Sheffy. And I'm Donya Williams. How are you doing today? Hope you guys are enjoying your Sunday. And because I can imagine we already have a lot of questions, we are going to get straight to it. So thank you again for see all of you who are um, tuning in and saying hello. So again, we're getting people from all over the place. So this week we are really excited because we have Dr. Blaine Benninger. Uh, he is an author. He's also, at, I believe, he can correct me on this, that he is still an intellectual property attorney. Um, so definitely have a question about how you go from law to genetic genealogy. <laughs> he is also an author of a number of books on genetic, genetic genealogy, his last being the family tree guide to DNA testing and genetic genealogy, um, which is a great book. And if you're new to genetic, um, to DNA testing and genetic genealogy, it's a book that I highly recommend that you get. So with that being said, welcome to the show, Dr. Bettinger. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, I am very excited because you are the one that's going to finally get my questions answered. I do hope, I do hope, I do hope. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to, so for the first softball question, how did you, considering your, your law background, <clears throat> how did you get involved in, what was your interest in genealogy and genetic genealogy particularly? You know, actually, my interest in genealogy and DNA predates my, my legal career. So I started genealogy in middle school, a typical take the tree home and fill it out assignment. And, uh, you know, I, I joke that I'm, I'm still trying to complete that assignment many years <laughs> later. <laughs> but then uh, in about 2003, I was in grad school. I was working on my PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology, and I was focusing on genetics. And... I saw an online ad for a DNA test for genealogy. And so at that time, 2003, it combined two of the things I love the most, genetics and genealogy. I took that test and I got hooked. I started my blog, The Genetic Genealogist in 2007, and the rest is history. I started lecturing and then I started writing and, and here I am today. So it's uh, then in 2006, actually a few years after that DNA test, I decided to go from grad school, finished up my PhD, and then went into law school to do intellectual property. Um, and uh, then, you know, went to law school and started a career as an intellectual property attorney, which I continue to do to this day. Excellent. And we will post a link to Blaine's blog at the end of the show. Um, just to put that out there, because I know we're going to get questions on that one. And did you want to read the first question that we had? I can't pull it up to so you. I'm still trying to pull okay, well, it up. Okay, well, if you want to ask your question, I'll Okay, so I'll ask my question. So my question is um, just, this is probably a standard question for most African Americans. So I want to give you um, an example from my own personal thing. I know for a fact that I am a descendant from both white and African American people. Um, I know for a fact via paper trail that my ancestors were enslaved by their parents in certain instances. And even when, even when um, before Ancestry uh, removed the six and six to eight CMs, those people were actually showing up. But I had already proven before those people were there by documents that I was connected to them. So at a 6 to 8 CM, when they were there at 6 to 8 CM, and my mom, and they were popping up on my mom's DNA, now they're gone. One of the biggest issues for most African Americans is the fact that they're saying that 6 to 8 CM was a false positive. But I have proof that these people are connected to my family. How do you make the difference? How do you, how do you, you know, say that they're not when they actually are? Right, right. So I'll just note that oh, technically Ancestry didn't say they are false matches. They said they could be, and they might have said they probably are, right? So there's no question. There is no one will dispute this whatsoever, that there were absolutely valid matches in the six to eight Centimorgan range. The, the, the dilemma that everyone faces is that Currently, there's no way to accurately determine which of those small segments are valid matches and which of those segments are invalid matches. That's the problem. So 
even, for example, finding a genealogical connection doesn't alone establish that that small segment is valid. So that's, that's the dilemma. The fact that, yes, there's no question, many of those small segments were real matches. No one really knows exactly what the percentages are, whether it was 25% valid, 75% invalid, or whatever it might be. But uh, the problem is, is that there's no way to distinguish even finding a genealogical connection doesn't prove that the small segment is uh, is valid, and that's that's where the problem comes in. So, um, what, so what does six to eight cm equal to fourth to fifth cousin or fifth to eighth cousin? You know, what 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 does that equal to? Actually, it can vary a lot. You could share a six centimorgan piece of DNA with a third cousin or you could share it with a 15th cousin. It, that's, the, that's another issue that comes in with small segments is that they can be relatively recent and, or they could be very, very old. And that's, that's another problem with those small segments. So why get rid of it? Well, I think, uh, and again, I'm not, I, well, let me say on the outset, I don't speak for Ancestry. Right. I'm, not, uh, I'm not affiliated with them. I, I don't get you know, nothing, uh, no affiliation whatsoever. So. All I can say is what my own personal opinions are. My personal opinions are that um, I actually don't think many people were using those small segments. Um, so I think one of the arguments was that, um, you know, that they were misleading a lot of people. And I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that so much because I don't think a lot of people were actually using those small segments. Um, mm. So I'm not sure that that's such a valid argument. I think there are probably better arguments that they were taking up a lot of processing speed because I don't know about you and I can't remember my exact numbers, but my number of matches, I don't know if it gotten cut in half or it was a huge, huge decrease in the number of matches once those small segments got taken away. So the, the processing speed, the analysis speed of the, the machines and servers at Ancestry are certainly far less burdened now as a result of that. Whether that's an, a valid reason for removing them, that's, an, that's, you know, that's a, a personal opinion for everybody that, that, you know, that, they, that they have to consider for themselves. Okay, well. Because there, there was a, a great deal of anger amongst um, people of color and yeah. African-American researchers. They were yep. using it. And, just and I, just, to, just to give you that, because I know what you were saying, you didn't think a lot of people were using it, but a lot of people were using it. African-Americans, yeah, but I think there are certain populations that use them and others didn't, right? So yes, you're right. I think people of color did use them because there, the lack of records meant that there was more utility to those possible. Well, I, right? I'm, so, I'm going to have to disagree with you on that one. And the reason being because, like I said, when I started my question, I had already found those people well before the DNA. We had already known. So it, the... It, it doesn't have anything to do with the lack of records because I actually just read that article while we were waiting for the show to start. Mm -hmm. so then, it's an article in Psychology Today about... Um, the psychology of the kind of burgeoning interest in um, genealogy. Right. And they made a comment about the fact that African Americans can't really find their families because of the lack of records. And like you just shook your head, that's incorrect. That's just an right. incorrect statement. And it shouldn't be said because we can. It's harder, yes, but we can find our families. And and but but in the same instance, I didn't need the DNA in order to find my families. The DNA helped okay. consecrate it. Yeah, confirm it. Yes, it confirmed it. it. It put it where it's supposed to be. So, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons, and that was one of the main reasons why I wanted you on the show so that you could help me understand better because Brian and, all, and a couple of others always tell me, Donya, you really do understand the DNA. But let me tell you, Blaine, I hate DNA <laughs> <laughs> with everything in me. But um, I mean, I, I, I still, I get it. Okay, I'll suck it up and say that I get it. But I hate it with the white hot intensity of a thousand suns. And, um, but I must say, losing those six to eight CMs has um, really moved me from ancestry so far because it, 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 it's a lot. It takes a, it took a lot away from what 
we as African Americans have to do. And now they've set us back yeah. a lot. They have. Kind of okay, the way so that I, kind of the way I, that I've worked with them is again I've got a very well well developed tree. So in some instances they those small C okay. So you have people that you share a lot more CMs with. So say for instance over 70 CMs. So being, especially coming from a lot of lines that Donnie and I do that are very entangled, they're very endogenous, mm -hmm. and we, have, we do have the periodic um, pedigree collapse. So per, my preference is working with people that I share more DNA with, and then those smaller segments actually, it was the fine tuning. It kind of, told, it kind of indicated which specific family lines I should look at and what's, what records I actually needed to, to go to to be able to work all of that, work all of that kind of business out. Sure. No, and I, you know, I mean, those are all, I, I understand all of those points. I'll just note a couple of things in, in response to that is number one, that there have, has been not a lot, but some scientific study of the validity of small segments, right? And every scientific analysis that's been done has established that a significant percentage of those small segments are false and that there's no clear signal between which are real and which are valid. Now, I understand that you know, finding a match to someone you expect to find a match to would suggest that that segment is valid, but scientifically, it doesn't prove that that segment is valid, right? It could be pure coincidence that they show up, especially when we have, let's say, you know, if I had 20,000 small segment matches, what are the odds I don't find someone I expect in that in that list, right? And so that's the problem. Is it just confirmation bias, or is it actually proving, uh, or is it actual genetic evidence? So, yes, having those people in your tree and expecting to share DNA with them, or thinking you should, you know, when you find that small segment, the problem is, is it doesn't prove that that small segment is valid. It doesn't prove the relationship. It just can't because we have we know that the small segments so many of them are false we don't know whether it's just coincidence or whether it's a a true match that's well, maybe, the underlying problem maybe you can help me with this question because i i couldn't get one from ancestry and again that the caveat it blame does not work for ancestry he's not a consultant for ancestry so this is very much your opinion Correct. um i've read the studies about the level of false mass matches with majority or exclusively european descended people Mm -hmm. When I tried finding similar studies for African descended people, Hispanic descended people, Asian, Middle East, well, no, Middle Eastern, there was a comparable one. And for the Jewish community of Eastern Europe, there was also a comparable one to the European one. I couldn't find anything that was related to African descended people and people of Latinx origins. Have you ever come across a study like that that looked at it? that looked at exactly the same thing about false matches, but for non-white populations. I'm not aware of a study that's done that, no. Um, the biggest study that's been done to date was done by uh, 23andMe in 2014, mm -hmm. utilizing their database. Mm -hmm. And that study, from what I can recall of reading it, I don't know if they even discussed the diversity of the database that they used at that for that study. So I don't know. Uh, you know, other than that study, I mean, that's really the major study that's been done. That's the one that's peer reviewed. Most of the others are all sort of, um, you know, more uh, individual people doing their own analyses. Um, but no, I'm not aware of one that's looked at specific population. Okay, so it's not me being dim trying to <laughs> trying to find something. You're not that's missing actually... anything. No, you're not. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no. Because the interesting thing is, I have read studies about that have looked at African DNA. And that's some of the most differentiated DNA in terms of you know, eth you know, large scale ethnic populations. And I was trying to explain to Ancestry that me, I'm, I'm a very mixed person. I've got Ancestry across many different ethnic groups. And I was trying to explain to them that me sharing a random European mutation that's not a relation, that's not a direct biological relationship, it just didn't feel right to me. And what I was reading kind of was suggesting that too. So like I said, that was on, that was another. Uh, and, and clearly, I mean, we know this throughout all of genetics, right? Every, all genetic analysis, all genetic studies are severely lacking in diversity. And, um, you know, this is just one more area where a lot more study needs to be done to understand 
potentially, you know, false matching and, and so on in different populations. True. And again, look at all the tweaks that all of the DNA companies are doing, trying to differentiate between the French and the Germans. Right. They, they right. Still exactly. Yeah, they still haven't really quite worked that out. No, not even close. You know, and that also raises one other point I wanted to make is that, you know, Ancestry was the only company that was providing those small matches. So, you know, none of the other testing companies were providing matches that small in part because of the issue of valid versus invalid segments at that range. Okay. So first question from an audience member. Sorry, I'm going to be, should have bifocals, but I don't. Uh, <laughs> is from Kate O'Hara. A known third cousin tested, oh, well, we're not really here to talk about Y-DNA, so if you don't want to, that's, that's fine. Um, actually, if you can limit your question to autosomal, um, but a known third cousin tested Y-DNA and matches my brother with a genetic distance of six. Isn't that a large number for a third cousin? That is a large number. It, you know, the, 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 it's so funny. Every question I get about Y-DNA always misses the key aspect that's needed. And that is how many markers are we talking about? Because a genetic distance of yeah. six at 37 markers means, you know, your relationship is ancient. But a genetic distance of six at a 111 markers isn't actually so bad. So true. Yep. It all depends on how many markers that we're talking about. So, yes. Sorry, Kate, that we can give you a more fuller answer on mm -hmm. that one. Uh, from Diane Doyle. My husband's mother was adopted. I've checked his DNA matches identifying chromosomes of each. How do I now identify the different family lines to find the DNA matches that relate to his mother's birth father? Um, Ancestry and 23andMe show different information in terms of percentages versus CMs. This sounds kind of like a chromosome painting question yeah. if I'm, if I'm interpreting yeah, it's that. Not real not real clear. So, yeah. you know, whenever you're working with an unknown uh, parentage research question like this, really what I typically recommend is you, you just start clustering your matches together, form those groups of clusters, right? Do you, the, the colored dots at Ancestry are especially helpful for that. So, you know, once you form those clusters and start working out the ancestry of those clusters, you know, you start to create these puzzle pieces that can only come together in one way to result in uh, a certain a birth. And so that's typically how these unknown parentage um, research projects uh, initiate. Okay, did you have another question? There's, do we have all, have we answered all the questions on there yet? Because okay, we yet. wanna, let me let the group know that we really wanted you guys to, to do your questions on the event first. Those questions take priority. So I see you have a lot of questions that are popping up on here. So we wanna make sure we do the, priority on the questions on the event first and then we will come to the um the actual comments and go on your questions there brian i'm still having trouble i had to restart so you're okay. gonna have to read them uh oh here's another y dna one um can you oh this is a really good question from louise maxfield can you please talk about working with matches when you have no first cousin or second cousin matches yeah, that, that's, that's tough. And it, 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 what's interesting is how much variability there can be. So, for example, um, because the databases are so uh, U European and US centric, people who are um, uh, from, from immigrant populations, for example, recent immigrant populations, they often get no close matches because not enough people from those populations have tested. So. That can mean, for example, some of your closest matches can be distant third and fourth cousin matches. Now, how you work with them is really actually the same. You're, you, you find a match you're interested in, you review the tree of that match to see if you can find any commonalities. You look at the matches you share in common with that match and see if you can kind of work together within that group to, to identify commonalities. But how you work with them really isn't all that different. What you have to do is you have to kind of keep in mind, however, of where you're looking for the connection, right? With a first and second cousin match, you're looking for a connection within the last few generations. When you start to move towards predicting third and fourth cousins, you know you're working more towards great great grandparents and great 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 grandparents and so on. So it's going to be a little further back in time. But knowing where you should be looking for a connection really helps you narrow in on what generation should I be looking for. Obviously, you're not looking at the parents of your 
third cousin match, right? You're looking at their ancestors further back in time. Now, following on from that, because basically we're talking about a time period where life expectancy was short, especially if you, you know, your ancestors came from, um, didn't have a lot of money. Um, so is there a way that looking at your, if you don't have first and second cousin matches, to be able to account for multiple marriages? So basically trying to look for clues that the people who match you match you because they're like half cousins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where it gets really tricky because um, so some of these half cousin relationships, you know, the ge ge genealogical connection is, is closer, but the genetic relationship is a little bit more distant because it is a half cousin instead of a whole cousin. The problem is, is there's no real easy way to say, you know, this person's probably a half cousin instead of a, a full cousin. So you have to, what you have to do is you have to work with what's known about that amount of DNA. What do I mean by that is if you share, uh, let's say 75 centimorgans with someone, for example, there are a, a relatively well-known collection of relationships that 75 centimorgans can fit into. And so that should be about what your consideration is. The problem is, is the smaller that amount gets, the more relationships you have to consider. So once you start getting towards 20 centimorgans, the number of relationships you have to consider is just enormous. So yeah, that's why it's better to work with closer matches. But again, some of us don't have very close matches. So, you know, pick your the closest that you do have and definitely work with those first. Okay. Um, I'm going to summarize Karen Palmer's question down, down to something more simple. So basically she's saying on her, on her maternal side of the family, they lived in a very rural part of Alabama for multiple generations. And it sounds like it was a community that there were a lot of intermarriages between the few families that lived there. She's asking for advice about using color coding on ancestry to be able to account for that. Is there, is there like a tip or a trick that you can, can suggest? Uh, not really. So when it comes to things like endogamy and pedigree collapse and intermarriage like this, it's, it's always going to be challenging. However, one of the kind of guidelines that are, that's being developed within the genealogical community is to focus on the largest segments within those populations. So for example, if you know you're related to a group of people that are from that same area and you have with them that problem of pedigree collapse and this intermarriage, by looking at the people that you share the largest segment with, those are more likely to be from the more recent relationship that you've identified. So if you're related to someone and you're their second cousin, but you're also their fifth cousin and their third cousin once removed, right? The longest segments are more likely to be from the more recent relationship. And so that may help you identify people within that grouping that are more recently related than those that are more distantly related. Um, my advice on that one, and Donnie, you can chime in, because Donnie and I have this all over our ancestry, <laughs> going all the way back to Virginia. Part of what helps us in determining that is really understanding all of the families that lived in a small community. Um, I'm thinking particularly my, my father's ancestry in Southwest Virginia, in a place called uh, with, with County, Virginia. There is a lot of interconnection between those families and by building the tree out, documenting all the intermarriages and really getting a sense of who was marrying whom and all of that kind of a mess um, helped me enormously in terms of tackling something like that. You know, I, I think we can't emphasize enough how important the genealogy really is, right? This DNA stuff is great, but if you don't have a, a solid genealogical foundation, the DNA is, is going to kind of flounder, right? It's kind of flopping around out there because it doesn't have anything to attach to. You have to have that skeleton of the genealogical research um, in order to really have something to, to stick that DNA to. Mm -hmm. um, and even something like when, once you're looking at a community like that, understanding even something as simple as naming conventions, is, it can be a real help. So for instance, if I'm looking at a family in Southwest Virginia and I'm seeing the name Theophilus, there's two families I know I immediately have to go and look at because that was such a popular name mm. down those two families. So again, that, hopefully that's a little, a little tip or a hint that can help you on that one. Got another question. This is kind of a Y DNA related one, but not necessarily. Um, someone's trying to find their husband's three times great grandfather on his male line. So it goes her husband, his father, grandfather. 
how, but they don't know who this three times great grandfather is. Is there a way that you can suggest in terms of looking at DNA that can help this person potentially identify who the three times, you know, what, what is it that they should be looking at? Yeah, so I think I would take in this particular question, I would take a two prong approach. I think I would definitely recommend Y-DNA, as you said, because that, uh, although it's sort of a fishing expedition, you might catch a fish, right? So if, if that person, the direct patrilineal descendant, the Y-DNA descendant of that person takes a Y-DNA test, it may point right towards a potential biological surname. And I can't tell you how many times people have done this test and they get a potential surname. They look at the census record and guess who's next door, right? Someone with that that surname. So that happens a lot. It also happens, however, that they get the results back and there's not a single match whatsoever. So that one's kind of a gamble. But as far as I would also take an autosomal DNA approach, I would test multiple different descendants of that um, third great grandfather, or perhaps they might have to stick with descendants of the second great grandfather, depending on, you know, what the family uh, structure was. And then look for the shared matches amongst those descendants, because that's going to point towards the family lines that are through that third great grandfather. I have a um, question for myself. What is your your take on endogamy and the effect of DNA when it comes to endogamy? So, for example, our family, we know for a fact that endogamy played a huge role in, in, in our research. Um, we have several family members where, uh, like, for example, for me, I have an, a, my great grandmother's sister married her first cousin. So in, in marrying her first cousin, we also know that both of his parents are related to both my grandmother and my grandfather. So that's, that's just blood going everywhere. That's yeah. blood family members going everywhere. How do you tell, I mean, how can DNA help, uh, I guess, tell the difference or can it help you tell the difference? And does it make um, one person become a closer match than they should be to someone? Well, that's exactly, oh, sorry. I was just sorry, gonna Brandon. say as an example, Donnie and I are technically fourth cousins, but because we share so many common sets of ancestors that fourth cousins shouldn't share. Or even worse. Sheila and my mom, second, third, fourth cousin. Yeah, yeah it, God rest her soul, but she just hit and answered me. So yeah, I have, we had have one person who's passed on. Her name was Sheila Hightower Allen. You might've known her. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't know my Sheila. <laughs> so she was my mother's second, third, and fourth cousin. On family tree DNA, she popped up as a second cousin. On um, ancestry, she popped up as a fourth cousin. On Jed Matt, she popped up as a a third cousin, I think, and on a, the other site was on Twenty Three and Me, she popped up as a third cousin. So long story short, we share more DNA than fourth cousins. Yeah, we share. we just share constant, and that's yep. Edgefield as a whole. So what? How do you answer that? Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's the effect of those multiple um, shared lines. Is it inflates the the amount of DNA? that you would otherwise expect for that relationship. So there's, it's sort of a twofold approach, right? Let's, let's take the approach of, you know, there are multiple relationships. Then in that case, having that genealogical information is very helpful. And when you get the results back and you share a DNA at a higher level than you would expect, it fits in with the narrative very well, right? Because you knew there were multiple relationships. That's sort of the easy approach. The difficult approach is where you don't know that there were multiple relationships mm. and you get this result back and it says, hey, you two are second, predicted to be second cousins. And you look at the trees and that doesn't make any sense whatsoever because you don't share great grandparents. But then what you should do is when you have that kind of instance, consider the effect of pedigree collapse and endogamy and consider, oh, you know what, maybe we're not second cousins. Maybe we're third cousins and fourth cousins and fifth cousins. And that explains why we share so much DNA. So it's actually pushing the DNA, the, 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 uh, the result back as opposed to pushing it forward. It may not be second cousin. It actually be further back because of, oh, okay. I never thought of it like that. That is my Quaker ancestry all day, every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My French Canadian too. Yep. So I have one person who asked the question and they actually said, what is Jet match? 
what how do you use it um you know and what are the benefits from it that was kind of a whole wrap around of it and yeah that, that's actually a great question because again i hate dna just in case i didn't say that <laughs> <laughs> um GenMatch is a so just to be uh, just to be clarified GenMatch is a third party tool so it's not a dna testing company it's a website that allows you to upload your raw data your dna um, testing results from a testing company into that database and there's something like I don't remember the exact number, something like almost 1.5 million profiles in that database, something like that. And so some of the benefits of GEDmatch is that if you have it tested everywhere, then you might find matches from the testing companies where you haven't tested. So let's say I've tested only at 23andMe. By uploading to GEDmatch from 23andMe, I might get matches from people that only tested at Family Tree DNA and have also uploaded to GEDmatch, Ancestry and have also uploaded to GEDmatch. Now, that being said, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of testing in every or being in every database, because I always say your best match is going to be at the last test, testing company you test at, right? So be in every database. Now, if you're in every database, you're not going to get new matches at GenMatch. But that being said, you are going to potentially, there's great tools available at GenMatch. There, uh, let's say you've tested at Ancestry, for example. You know what you don't get at Ancestry is you don't get segment data. You don't get the GPS coordinates of the pieces of DNA that you share with your match. But you, if you and your match transfer to GEDmatch, now you can get that chromosome browser view, the GPS coordinates, and you can say, oh, we share a piece of DNA on chromosome 18. Then you can do things with that. You can map it in a chromosome mapper. You can do um, uh, like DNA painter. There's other tools. There are a ton of tools available at GEDmatch that you can use. And I have a question from Mark McLeod, and I'm going to try to simplify this. So again, we're, both of us are very familiar with MyHeritage, and he's really impressed, as am I, with that clustering tool. Is I think you might have actually written about this on your website. I tried finding it and couldn't. He would like to do something similar, but using an Excel spreadsheet with his, you know, downloading his matches and, and putting them in Excel. Is there a way that you can kind of replicate not exactly the, the the clustering outcome, but get the same information that you would if you if you had done that? Um, well, the problem is that you need to get the uh, shared match information, and that's what can be difficult to get. So the clustering downloads, you know, the it, it has access to the names of all of your matches and so on, but. It has, it, they, most of them have difficulty getting that extra piece, which is who shares DNA with who, right? Who forms these groupings? Um, and so it has to be able to get that extra information to do that. And at MyHeritage, for example, I don't believe there's a spreadsheet you can download that has that sort of shared match information. Meaning, you know, I share DNA with John Doe and um, the, three, the two of us also share DNA with Guillermo. And so we form this cluster. Right, and so that's the extra piece of information we would need for you to be able to replicate that yourself. Okay, um, and from Jean Bai, ancest. Okay, this is an ancestry through line. I'm going to read the question. If you don't mind, I'm going to jump in first. Ancestry through line shows a fourth, two times great grandmother with one DNA match and 126 to 3,431 CMs. I think that might be a typo because that's a huge spread. I want to know if this is in fact myth. Oh, my fourth great-grandmother, as I don't have any way to verify. First of all, Jean, as much as I love some of Ancestry's true tools, through lines is, if you're familiar with the kind of we're related app, is just the we're related app. That is not coming from DNA. They're being generated from other people's trees. So you basically kind of have to go in and again, do the leg work, the paper trail work to make sure that what's being hinted at or displayed in the through line is actually correct. Um, I'm just gonna say for myself, and Donna can speak for herself, I don't mess with through lines. Um, not at all. Most of them for me are wrong. They're kind of right. They're, they're near enough correct that I can work out where the mistakes in other people's trees are. But do not take them as read, do not take that as proof. Through lines is not genealogical, it does not meet the genealog genealogical standard of proof in any way, shape, or form. 
Through Lines to me is a, um, a larger version of the We're Related app. And you have to do, if you guys remember the We're Related app on your phone, they would give you all these celebrities that you're related to and, mm -hmm. and all these different people and this, that, and the third and blah, blah, blah. Each one of them you had to research. They were just giving you stuff because they were going by what you had on your tree, not by DNA. I, that's, that's my that's my thing and I'm sticking to it. Let me, can I just interject one, one way that I have found through lines to be very useful. Um, and I, again, I agreed, I don't use them because I'm looking at, you know, other forms of matching. I'm working with individual matches rather than the, the clustering that, um, the groupings of through lines that Ancestry creates. However, I find that the through lines are good for finding Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA test takers. So for example, um, I have kind of a mitochondrial DNA mystery I'm working on. And so I went to the direct matrilineal ancestor through line. So my mother's 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 mother through line. And I looked at the lines that I, it identified of descent. And I found one that was a daughter of a daughter of a daughter of a daughter. And so I contacted that person and I said, would you be willing to take a mitochondrial DNA test because we should share mitochondrial DNA um, based on the genealogy. And um, she said, yes, I'd be happy to do that, but would you rather test my 95-year-old mother? God and I yes. said, yes, I sure would. <laughs> I <want> so, you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do find them useful for finding the potential mitochondrial and Y DNA test takers. Uh, of course, as you say, you have to confirm the genealogy, but um, I, th I find that to be a really good use. Well, I mean, she's 95, so definitely. <laughs> But right? I mean, you, so you don't think that, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, in my, I, from my work with the through lines and then paying attention to both the through lines and then the we're related app, it, it doesn't seem like it actually, it, it looks like it's looking at the tree. So for example, I know who my grandmother is. I know who she is for a fact. <laughs> and I had somebody who, whose tree connected through through lines on the tree, but they told, but it, the tree was saying that my grandmother was someone else. And I'm like, that's not my grandmother. And you're going by what? And, and then when you try to tell them, no, that, that, no, that's not, that's not my grandmother's mother. I know who my grandmother's mother is. Oh, well, I'm going to get a professional genealogist. It took everything in me not to like really kind of go off and cuss this person out. Like I know, I know who my people are. Who are you talking to? But nevertheless, these are the kind of things that happens when you. It, well, for me, I'm not going to say for everybody, but for me, and I think it's happened for Brian as well. But in the same instance, let's look at Moses. You actually got people to change the name of who the mother was so that it could make a difference in in finding out who Haygood actually was. Well, I was going to say, by getting so many people yeah. who had misinformation in their tree to correct their tree actually did point out who the ancestor of, who the, the mother, genetically who the mother of Moses Williams was. Still don't have a first name for her, but at least we know that the family group that she descends from. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm... It frustrates me and it annoys me because to cut a long story short, we have a four times great grandfather, Moses Williams, who had 45 children, 40 girls and five boys who were born enslaved. The, the boys were easy to find, the daughters because they all married, by the time the 1870 census rolled around, had been very hard to find. And people, unfortunately, when they see the last name Williams and they're looking within a certain time period, they just throw them up. Oh, that's a daughter of Moses Williams. Well, the problem is there were at least five different Williams family groups all living in Edgefield County, and they're not all related. There's been a really brilliant Y DNA study done on the Williams family. So the men have five different Y haplo groups. Um, so you can't just assume, right. oh, because a lot, plus Williams is just a, a uh, common uh, name. It's the right. blindingly common name. Yep. Um, and that, that really did mess up some of our, some of our through lines. Yeah, I'm sure it did. In my instance, again, I was working with a line I 
I had the genealogy for. So I, I wasn't using through lines to generate the genealogy. I was only using it to identify descendants of my known matrilineal ancestor to find new potential DNA test takers. And I could go in and verify the trees myself. So that, you know, again, with through lines, don't do anything if you're not verifying the, the genealogy for yourself. Okay, so there's a question from Joyce Miller, and this is a jet match. Um, it looks like it's a, a beta or a beta, a beta version that she used. But on JetMatch, um, of her listed 50 matches that were over CMs, 20 of them are single segments, ranging from 34 CMs to 24 CMs. Um, I tried not to count those. I knew tri triangulated, so, I, so she basically she did everything she could to make sure there was no duplications. Um, she hasn't been able to identify any of these matches that she's working with, despite some good trees. So her question is, is my DNA disproportionately very old? Um, my background is entirely in the UK. So I think what she's trying to ask is, because she's not making any headway with it, and she's dealing with 34 CMs to 24 CMs, is that going back too far for her to be able to figure out how she's related to this group of people? Yeah, I think that's probably the case. Um, you know, a small a segment of, say, for example, and again, this is an area where lots more study is needed, but a segment of 20 centimorgans, for example, could easily be 10 generations or more um, old. And so when you're working in the range of, of 24 to 34, you, you could be working out to, to 10 generations to find that common ancestor, and that can be really challenging. So we, I think many of us have matches in these range where no matter what we do, we, we, they have a great tree and we have a tree and, and we do the comparison and, and there's just nothing we can find, not even a location in common. And, and I think that's because it probably predates the trees that we've built. Cool. Um, and speaking of another question, would you say it's important to understand kind of movements of people within specific points in time. So for instance, using, I don't know, how familiar are you with colonial Virginia? Uh, vaguely. Vaguely. Um, I guess what colonial, what colonial place are you really familiar with? Mostly the Northeast. Okay. So for instance, I don't know, um, what is the likelihood that an ancestor would be going from, oh, what is that, um, from Worcester to Boston, to Medford, to somewhere like way up towards Vermont and New Hampshire in the, the 1700s. How likely is it that someone would have moved around that much? That would not be terribly likely, at least in that time period. OK. Um, that, that was kind of summing up a very long, very, very detailed kind of question. So mm -hmm. you know, again, in terms of hopefully the message that's coming through from, from Donia, from myself, and from Blaine, is DNA, while it can answer a lot of questions, it it's, it's one tool in a toolbox. Mm -hmm. And like any set of tools in a toolbox, you have to use more than one yep. to get the job done. And I think part of the issue is that I think it's fantastic. And we can't, I think we can't overlook the fact that DNA has brought so many people to the world of genealogy, new people. And I think that is amazing right because uh, it's it's a fantastic thing every new person we get in the genealogical community is one more potential collaborator that will have a record or a piece of information that can help us out At the same time because so many people are brought to the world of genealogy by dna they mistakenly believe that dna is the most important thing in genealogy and there is no most important thing in genealogy other than um you know good genealogical research skills right so you know the DNA is very, very powerful, but it only is powerful when it's combined with good genealogy, right? So, um, and what I mean by that is traditional genealogical research. You could do the best DNA work in the world, but if you're not combining it with the genealogy, with traditional genealogical records, you will get absolutely nowhere with it. Okay. I have a working with ethnicity and DNA question. I'm going to use my own family as, um, as an example. So growing up in my family and my mom's family here in DC, we were, we were given a family story that her father's father was an Irishman. 
So I did the D. I was the first one in my family to do a DNA test, and I'm expecting to see a big wedge of Irish. Well, I, I have Irish, but it's nowhere near what a great grandfather should have been. Where that should have been sitting was Ashkenazi Jewish, which threw me for a loop. But I knew immediately who it related to because I had nailed down that that generational level for everyone else except for my grandfather. I always felt there was a question mark. So, at least. Because that was so re relatively recent, I was able to go through all of my Jewish DNA matches and work out who that who that missing, two, you know, uh, great grandfather actually was. How how reliable would you say working with ethnicity with in terms of DNA results can be? I ask that because I think these companies are still nailing the ethnicity part down. There's still a lot more work that needs to be done. There's a lot more populations that need to be tested. Even the, the data sets that they have can be further expanded. But just generally speaking, just in ex like that example that I gave you, is that something that you, can, that you can work out to work with to make discoveries? I think, the, unfortunately, the answer I have to give is it depends. I think you gave a great example of, of where it does work. Um, I have an, a personal example. I've worked with someone where they expected their, their ethnicity results to be 100% Northwestern European. They got the results back and it was, there was 25% Southern Europe. And so that clearly indicated that one grandparent was probably not the grandparent they thought it was because 25% of their DNA was from Southern Europe. And so it can give you clues. The problem is, is it, it depends on the facts of your genealogy and it also, relies on the fact that you can't put too much into it. It is, it is only giving you a, a suggestion and something that you can pursue. You need to be careful about you know, jumping to a conclusion. And I see this a lot, that people will get their results back and jump to a conclusion and say, oh, there must be a misattributed parentage event, or there must be this, or there must be that. But uh, you're never going to get that clear an answer. You take the clue, you investigate it, you test it, and do what you can to, 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 to either support it or break it down. So if this is all beginning to sound a little bit like CSI genealogy, it kind of mm -hmm. is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. One person asked the question, but I don't think you can answer this one because it, it may have something to do with ancestry. But you can, if it does, then let me know. Um, Valerie Evans said, speaking of ethnicity, why are so many people Scottish now? <laughs> oh. Yes. So um, I don't know if you recall, but it used to be that everyone was very Scandinavian. So there was um, yeah, I was years, years, years ago that was yeah. And so what I kind of call this the the Scottish problem. I believe <laughs> the recent updated ancestry has vastly overestimated the amount of Scottish ancestry. Either that or the Scottish were much more invasive in Europe than we have in history <laughs> has told us. Uh, but I think, yeah, I think uh, my prediction is in the next update, a lot of people are going to lose a lot of Scottish um, percentage. I've got a kind of complicated one uh, question from a woman called Helen. So if my mother has a different father than her siblings. That's the straightforward part of this. However, both fathers were first cousins once removed. Um, and she's tested a lot of people. Um, where is the question? So I guess what she's trying to say is when you have for, you know, first cousins um, and one of, them's, one of them's the father of the child, how can you kind of break through that to figure out which one of the two men is actually the, the biological father? Well, that is going to be really, really tough because um, you have a situation where the, the two potential fathers are so closely related. And that's a very, very close relationship, first cousin once removed. So your ability to tease out which one was the biological father of, of, of which is going to be really complicated. In that instance, um, what I typically tell people is if you can, try to use opportunity instead of the DNA. What I mean by that is who was in the right place at the right time, right? Because that may be an easier solution than trying to use the DNA because given that close relationship, I see this all the time where people identify a family and they narrow it down to say two brothers or three brothers, sometimes four brothers. 
And the ability to decipher between which of those four brothers using DNA is nearly impossible. So often they have to instead either say, I know it's one of them. It doesn't affect the genealogy because it's the same regardless of which brother it is, but it might come down to which brother was in the right place at the right time. That's the more likely candidate. But it, it can be really difficult when they're that closely related. So that's our Hammond problem. We, I, I have an ancestor who she was enslaved and at the age of 12 she was passed back and forth between a father and his eldest son. So her first child was born at the age of 13 mm -hmm. and because the husband married a cousin, again it's, an it's just an endogamous mess, I don't know which one of the two is my direct ancestor. I don't know mm -hmm. if it's the father or the son. Yep. Um, and I've had to resign, I've had to reconcile myself. At least I have the family. I've got the right family and I can kind of take the ancestry back beyond that point. But yeah, when it comes to the Hammonds, it's-, it's We don't like them. It's either gonna be one of the, one or the other. Yeah, we don't, we don't like them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's just what it is. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, as far as, for, for African-American research, our research, because because our families were, we have a lot of families that either were enslaved or you had the, the mixed heritage with the mulattoes and things of, you know, mulatto families and things of that nature. It, it makes it difficult for us to not be able to utilize the DNA in a manner that we need to utilize it and still do the research. So I guess um, one of the things that I, I wonder about what is your take as far as using all of the different things that they have, like the Jed match, the living DNA, because someone actually asked about living DNA. I mean, do you choose one over the other? Is there one that you use more than the other when doing this kind of research? Because you have to, you know, especially for people of color because you also have this same issue for you know latinx you have it for anybody with you know we all know european let me rephrase that genealogy the research itself is set up more for europeans than it is for people of color no matter what color so that's anybody so right. everybody has with the exception of europeans everybody has some type of extra roadblock not saying that european researchers don't have a roadblock but it's not like people of color so with that being said when you do research for others and you might research someone for uh that is of people you know someone of people a person of color is there a certain tool that you use that helps you find information on them when it comes to the fact, you know, helping them find their families. Yeah, I got it out. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question. And again, I think probably my number one recommendation is, especially if this is going to be a long-term project, it's always hard because when you're, if you're being paid to do client work, which I actually don't do, that's, you have a much tighter time frame, and you can't work in it to the kind of depth you really need to. But if this is your own project and you're working on it, one of my absolute biggest recommendations is be in every single database because you never know where that one match that can really help you with that brick wall will, it will come from. Maybe that person tested at 23andMe and not at Ancestry. And if you're only at Ancestry, you'll never find that person at 23andMe that's going to help you out. So, you know, the, the more and the more, the more you test at more of these places, the more of your own family members you test, right? Because when you add more, your own family members to the database, you're increasing the amount of DNA of your ancestors in that database. So the more of your ancestors DNA you have in a database, the more databases you're in, the more you're catching matches through those people and the more you're gonna get, uh, I don't wanna say lucky, but the more you're going, it's, because it's not luck, you're taking a focused research approach by putting as much DNA of ancestors as possible in as many databases as possible. And that's gonna maximize your chance of getting the matches you need to uh, break through a brick wall. That's number one. Number two is again, and I think we've really harped on this quite a bit, is that it's, DNA is one little aspect. You, it cannot be the focus of all of your research because you'll never get anywhere. You need to be focusing as well as much as you can on the genealogical research 
in addition to doing the DNA. Oh. Okay, and I've got a two-parter in a FIBA, if I can be really cheeky and ask for an extra 90 seconds <laughs> on this one. Thank you. Sorry, that's our producer. Um, we're trying very hard not to go over time. <laughs> so the first part of my question is, is it possible or conceivable for someone that shares 20 CMs with an individual for that to be a false match? Uh, if it's a 20 centimorgan piece of DNA, I don't believe it's very, I don't think it's likely at all that that can be a false match. Okay, so the question is, I have a 20 CM match who did not match a known maternal match at that location, I guess a specific a geographical location, nor a known paternal match at the same site, I'm assuming DNA testing site, all with the same DNA database. Now this individual is believing that that's a false match, but as soon as I saw 20 CMs, I'm like, no. no. <laughs> I mean, maybe if, it's on, if it really is a woman who's involved in this on the maternal side, maybe she went somewhere else to have a child and that, that was that. I mean, I can't, ex I can't explain what's going on there, but I would, I, my advice would be to relook at that match because 20 CM seems an awful lot. That's a lot. Yeah, that's not a false match. I hate DNA and I know that's a lot. <laughs> I hate DNA. But <laughs> uh, there is one more quick question that I wanted to ask you. And that question is, when doing your DNA research, it just left me. Oh my God. <laughs> I hate when that happens. Oh, I know. Yep. Oh, well, shoot. while you're thinking of that, I just want to give a shout out to everyone who posted their questions. There's some, all of them are really good. There's some, some standout questions in here. Um, I felt kind of sorry for you a little bit, Blaine, because, for some of them, because it was kind of throwing you in the lion's den, because there were, there were some very, very specific detail questions oh um, yes yeah and you, you i get did those a, a lot yeah <laughs> and you did a brilliant job in terms of fielding those oh thank you um while dying is still thinking i just want to give a shout out for our show next week next sunday at 4 p.m eastern standard time we will be speaking with daniel horowitz um talking about what's new at my heritage because they have some pretty cool new to new tools yeah daniel is the dna um the head genealogy expert at my at, at my heritage so we will be speaking with him. And Blaine, I'm going to have to hit you up on the side with that question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, so, I literally yeah. cannot think of it. <laughs> so for next week's show, like this week's show, there is a discussion area in the actual event listing. Please post your questions for Daniel like you did for this week. Um, and again, there was, there was some very, very excellent questions. Blaine. Thank you for so generously sharing your time with us this Sunday. Yes. Um, well, thank you for having me. I, I had a great time and I really appreciate it. I, I appreciate you being here as well. You know, the conversation that you and I had, the opposition. I love the opposition. Like I said, we really, really needed that. And um, it, it was it was good. I hope you really enjoyed it because it was I really necessary. did. And I, I really appreciate that. I mean, I think we had a great conversation and yes. I'm glad we could have it. Yes, yes. Absolutely. So we will definitely be posting um, Blaine's blog and mm -hmm. website. Yep. Am I correct? That's right. Okay, so we will definitely get that. And if you're not involved, if you, you know, Blaine, also you have a Facebook page, right? That's right. Uh, Genetic Genealogy Tips and Techniques has uh, about uh, more than 70,000 people. And so it's a very, very collaborative and helpful group. Yes, so you guys follow it. Make sure you see it. And I just want to give a shout out to the people, to our fans. Yes. You guys showed up and you showed out. So I am very, very appreciative. Blaine, just to let you know, we have people all the way from Australia watching this particular oh, wow. show. So you, you know, thank you for everybody who just came out and showed up and showed out. And we just love mm -hmm. it. And we can't wait to see you guys next week. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, for new for people who aren't who are joining us for the first time, you can always catch us on demand right here on Facebook. We have a YouTube channel. You can get us on iTunes, SoundCloud, Pandora, Pandora, you name it, we're everywhere. We're everywhere. Thank you all for sharing your Sunday with us, and until next week, we'll see you later. Thank you. Thanks, Blaine. Thanks, Blaine. You've been you. great. <laughs>